Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallama ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Welcome back to Sahih al-Bukhari. We are on hadith number four or so. It's hard to... Um, <clears throat> the, the numbering of the hadith, usually in Sahih al-Bukhari, are continuous. But we are doing Kitab al-Iman, so in Kitab al-Iman, this would be the third hadith. Um, I haven't figured out how we're going to number it for the videos. But we'll begin with reading Brother Arshad. Well done. Um, okay, yes. Right here. So you can start with, no one's been saying, بِسْنَادِكَ الْمُتَصِلَ إِلَى الْمُصَنِّفِ رَحِمُ اللَّهُ قَالُ you can start with that. We get the barakah reading. Wait, it says uh, the first word is that we finished the uh, al Islam. Yeah, so from Bab, where yeah, from Bab would yeah, be. That's what I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. We finished the Bab. Ita'am al Qa'am min al Islam, Haddathana Amr ibn Khalid, Kal Haddathana al Layth an an Yazid an Abi al Khair an Abdullah ibn Amr. رضي الله عنهما أن رجلا سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أي إسلام خير قال تطعم الطعام وتقرأ السلام من عرفت ومن لم تعرف باب ال okay yeah okay that's good بسم الله so this chapter باب is called إطعام الطعام من الإسلام feeding Literally, feeding food is part of Islam, but that's an Arabic expression. It means feeding others is part of Islam, and hence it's linked to Iman. So we are looking at all the different components of what Iman is and what it necessarily leads to. So feeding others is part of Islam. implement that I have some food for you guys so Musa help me set this up in the back we should implement every hadith when we get to it come up with a creative way every week to implement hadith and you can bring water bottles from the kitchen maybe one brother um, yeah just from the fridge if you can grab some water bottles and then there's some drinks also so while we're talking, just feel free to go in the back and grab something. So first the hadith, what does it mean? So, you know, the prior hadith was about uh, preventing others from your harm. Man salim al-muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. So if you look at the sequence of the hadith so far, we are talking about iman and what a powerful thing it is and what are the components. And part of Iman is serving and helping others. So, so the last hadith and this hadith and moving forward, the theme is serving others, helping others. And that is part of Iman. You cannot be a believer in Allah without serving and helping his creation, being merciful towards his creation. So in that sequence of priority of serving others, um, the prior hadith was about what? What was the last hadith about? Right. Remember? Yeah, so well, what was that Islam? What is best? Like what is it teaching us to do? Yeah, so it's basically not doing something. It's like holding your tongue and your hand from other people, meaning preventing harm from other people. So in terms of service, serving the creation, the biggest priority is not harming them, right? So it's not that you feed people and you hurt them and you do other things. Like it doesn't make sense to, you know, do something for somebody while you're hurting them, right? Just like you know, in 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 Gaza today, Allah helps the situation and our hearts are bleeding. It's really hard to keep doing what we're doing, teaching these classes, but we have to go on, and we have to ask Allah in all of our prayers for help. But the whole focus of the world is so ridiculous. It's sending in trucks to feed people while you're killing them at the same time. 
Like, why do you need to feed people when the bombs are falling upon them? Like, that makes no sense. That's why in hadith, you would never see an idea like that. In our tradition, you would not have an idea like that. The biggest priority to help them is to stop those bombs from destroying their villages and their high-rises and thousands of children are being blown up. But then you're sending trucks and Biden is hypocrite has a nerve to say, oh, we are trying to bring in humanitarian aid, but we want Israel to keep, you know, bombing them. He says in the same sentence that full support, no matter what they do, we are behind them, where it's giving them even more money to do that. How does that make any sense? And no one has the nerve to stand up to them and say, how does it make sense to bring in trucks while the bombing is going on? The basic rules of warfare, you bring a ceasefire and then you help, help people, let them feed, you know, give the humanitarian aid, assistance, and all those things, but it doesn't make sense while the bombing is going on. So that's the same point here in this hadith. The prior hadith was more of a priority. Imam Bukhari understands these things. So he brought the hadith first about, you know, Iman is where your harm of others is prevented. You don't allow your hand or your tongue to harm other people. And then now is going forward. After that, what's the most important thing? Feeding as a high, high priority. The first thing is withholding harm, because it doesn't make sense to do any of those other things while you're still harming people. But now, when, when the harming is not there, among all the things you can do to help people, one of the amazing things is feeding others. And that's a very high priority in this deen. It's a great virtue. Nothing increases love between people and brings hearts together than feeding others. Something that, you know, um, but, so the Prophet ﷺ was asked a man asked the Prophet Ayul Islam khair, which Islam is the best and he said ta'am, feeding others salam ala man arafta wa man lam ta'rif. and to give the salam to those you know and those you don't know so there are two things here feeding others and salam spreading the greeting of peace so salam is something amazing. This, these, these are the things that bring people together. So part of iman, iman is not an abstract exercise, but it's a practical uh, reality that brings people together. You feed each other, it brings love between, it, it increases love between people. And saying salam to each other, that, that brings like a companionship. When you say assalamu alaikum to somebody, you know, it's kind of like you know them, but like, we have this habit, and this hadith is so relevant for us today. Many of us in the Muslim world and here, we only give salam to those we know. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Give salam to those you know and those you don't know. So there's nothing that brings hearts together better than that. So that's something, you know, we need to revive these great virtues. Um, these are the great virtues, and they're part of iman. If you have iman, you will have these. And these things have a reciprocal relationship on your iman. They increase your iman. And feeding others is a great virtue. Being hospitable to your guests is a great virtue. There's a poet, he said, I am a slave to my guest as long as he visits me. There's a great early uh, poetry that you'll find in books of Tafsir from Jahili poetry. I am a slave of the guest of mine, and this points to a great, you know, early Arabs, they had this hospitality, it was one of their greatest virtues. I am a slave to the guest as long as he visits me. And I have no quality of slaves other than this one. But the proud early Arabs, you know, this was a virtue for them, and being a slave was not. They hated slaves. And there was this, but in this matter, the matter of being hospitable to your guests, as long as the guest is in my house, I am his slave. And this is the only quality of slaves that I have. That's, that's what the poet was saying. So this is very, very important. Um, we need to revive these great virtues and realize that they're part of our iman and they will increase our iman. Now, spreading salam to others, you know, salam is, it means peace. Assalamu alaikum. So the broader meaning is peace. Like you can't, just like mm -hmm. we said, you can't bomb up people and bring humanitarian aid. It makes no sense. Just saying assalamu alaikum to others and then hurting them doesn't make sense. Like in the Muslim world today, you go to any any place in the bazaars, you get ripped off, but they say salam to you. Like what kind of salam is that where they're saying peace to you, but they know you're from out of town. They're going to charge you triple 
So, you know, salam is a reality. It has meaning. All these words, the adhkar, they have meanings. They're not just empty words. So as salam, spreading peace means you really spread peace. It's, yes, it's talking about greetings, not saying generally, like taqra as salam means to say as salam alaykum to others. But when you say that beautiful expression, what does that imply? Of course, you need to be a force for peace. And that is why, you know, from this hadith, you can remember another hadith. What were the first words of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina when he came? Remember, like he arrived in Medina. It was a it was a legendary event. Everyone was waiting for him for weeks. When he finally came, we we have the hadith from Abdullah ibn Salam, the Jewish rabbi. He said, I, you know, I was among those people. He wasn't Muslim then. I was among those people trying to see who this person was that's going to be our new leader. And he said the first first thing I noticed from his face, it wasn't a face of a liar. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the second thing, the first words he said to the people in Medina, what were the words? Who remembers the words? Afshu salam. Ayyuhan nas, O human beings, O people. He said a number of beautiful things. He said, Afshu salam. Spread the salam and the greetings amongst yourselves. But Dutari Mutaram, exact same thing from this hadith. Feed each other. What else did he say? Afshu salam. Pray during the night while people are asleep. And then, another narration, that's a fourth thing, maintain family ties. So these are the great virtues, the great teachings of Islam, the priorities. Salam, of environment of peace and, and greetings of one another, closeness, where you meet people you know and you don't know, feeding each other, um, and then uh, maintaining family ties is very important. And then spirituality, praying during the night when the people are asleep. The Prophet didn't say pray your obligatory prayers because that's understood. But the real virtue is people go beyond that. You do it out of the public eye. Sallu bil-layli wa nasu niyam. Praying out of the public eye. And that is the norm in worship. In, in worship, actually, the norm is to do it privately. In Islam, ibadah is meant to be private. That's the norm. That's the overarching norm. Only for the obligatory prayers, because of a Allah instituted a wisdom, He wants the community to get together. So, as salawatul maktuba, the obligatory prayers, you pray in congregation because you need to build a community. But every other prayer, all other acts of worship, the norm is to do them individually on your own, not in congregation. And that is why. Uh, Imam Malik, his opinion was when you make salam, the Imam, after salam, he immediately leaves. He doesn't sit there and continues to pray. And the Prophet ﷺ, he did not pray the sunnahs in the masjid. He prayed the salawat, the maktuba in the masjid, and the sunnahs he prayed at home. That's why we learn how many sunnahs he prayed from his wives, Umahat al Mu'minin. He used to pray them at home. Even the Fajr sunnahs he used to pray at home. And Bilal would come and take him to the masjid. So the norm in worship in general is private. It's at home. It's between you and Allah. Why? Because that is what sincerity is. When you pray in front of others, that sincerity element is automatically compromised. So there's less chance of you being sincere when people are watching you. So that's very, very important. So it's a great hadith. And now I want everyone to go back and grab something. And then we'll talk, have an isnad discussion. InshaAllah. So the Isnad I have on the screen, so we don't have to make a chart anymore. Uh, Ibad, you start. One person gets up, and everyone will go. Okay, I'll help you. Come on. Weak, man, I need it. <laughs> So the isnad of this hadith comes from Amr ibn Khalid. Okay. And who's next? Al Layf. Amr ibn Khalid from Layf, from Yazid, from Abu Al Khair, from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As. Okay. So this isnad is a special isnad. It has two features that are special. 
One is, it's an entirely Egyptian Isnad. Everyone is from Egypt here. It's Isnad of Masriyin. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. How was the Egyptian? Not that he was Egyptian, but he settled in Egypt. Why? Why would he settle in Egypt? That was his father, Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As became the governor of Egypt. Abdullah is his son. So obviously he's with his family. So Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, um, great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he settled in Egypt. And in Egypt, he was teaching this hadith to students. And for generations in Egypt, it was transmitted down. So who are these individuals? So not only the Isnad is all Egyptian, but all of these are great Imams. This is an Isnad of experts. So let's start with Amr ibn Khalid. So Amr ibn Khalid was, his kunya was Abu Hassan. His full name was Amr ibn Khalid, ibn Farrukh, ibn Sa'id, ibn Abdurrahman, ibn Waqid, ibn Layth, ibn Waqid, al-Harrani. And he's someone who lived in Egypt. He is one of the high teachers of Bukhari. In fact, out of the six, only Bukhari takes from him. Not because the rest didn't want to, but because he was the only one, because he traveled widely and he was the earliest of the six. And he was blessed to have many teachers or a number of teachers that many other people missed out on. So he's one of the highest teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. And he's the only one from the six that narrates from him directly. Abu Hatim graded him as Saduq. Saduq. He's someone who was reliable. And Amr ibn Khalid, he died in the year 229. 229. Amr narrates from who? Who's the man above him? No, like from the Isnad. No, Amr ibn Khalid. Amr ibn Khalid qala haddathana. No, what about Laith? Why are you missing Laith? Laith. So Laith ibn Sa'ad. This is Laith ibn Sa'ad. We talked about him in the previous Bukhari class because he was in one of the Isanid. Um, but Laith ibn Sa'ad was it's someone you have to know. He was a great, great Imam. He's called Imam al Masriyin. Uh, it's one of his titles. He was a great judge, mufti, an imam of Egypt. He was born near Fustat. He was of Persian origin, but he's from the first three generations. Laith ibn Sa'ad, an amazing individual. He's from the ranks of Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa. In fact, he met Abu Hanifa, learned from him. He was a friend of Imam Malik, and he, was a, he influenced Imam Shafari and Imam uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He was a student of Imam al-Zuhri. His, his greatest influence in hadith was Imam al-Zuhri. Uh, Imam, Imam al-Shafiri said about Laith, and I shared this earlier, Laithu afqahu min Malik. Laith was greater in fiqh, more learned than Malik, but he didn't have the best students. Malik had better students. Laith was a better teacher. So because he didn't have the best students, he was someone who was brilliant, he was an expert of hadith and he was an expert of fiqh. He had so many um, original ideas in fiqh and fatawa. Um, but his, he had a methodology of fiqh. But his madhab did not live on. So had it lived on, it would have been one of the five, one of the, it would have been a fifth among the four, Laithi madhab. But because he didn't have students that perpetuated, um, it didn't really outlive him. Um, so, Imam al Dhahbi said about him, كان الليث فقيه مصر ومحدثها ومحتشمها ورئيسها. And he said, so he, he praised him at length that he was a great Imam, a jurist of Egypt, the Muhaddith of Egypt, its standout individual, its leader. Many provinces were proud of his existence. He became the Grand Mufti of Egypt, one of the earliest people to get that title, the Grand Mufti of Egypt. And him and Malik, there's something to be said about Imam Malik and Imam Laith. They were friends. They had a rivalry also, because Imam Malik was from Medina. He had a different approach. 
he uh, believed in the amal of Ahlul Medina. Imam al you know, had different views. But they were very friendly, so they had a lot of correspondence between each other. But it's very wonderful when you read like their correspondence. It's really so inspiring how people were different, they had differences, uh, big differences between them, but they would write to each other and they had a good relationship. Um, one time, Imam Malik wrote to Laith saying, my daughter is getting married. I want to give her hand in marriage. Uh, I would like you to send me some um, Sa flowers, some type of flowers. So Ibn Wahab mentioned that Laith sent him 300 beautiful Sa flowers, which Malik used as a dye for his daughter's clothes, and he sold the remaining. So they would write to each other about their family matters. They would write to each other, um, you know, asking about each other. And then the famous letter I referenced that earlier, where Malik wrote a letter to Laith about his fiqhi opinions, and and Laith wrote back to him, so there's a back and forth, and it's published. Um, you can read it. I think I shared it on Telegram earlier, but I'll try to do it again. But that's where Imam Malik makes the case for his approach to the Amal Ahl al Medina. And Imam Malik criticizes him for a number of his opinions. And then Laith defends himself and writes back. But if you read the beginning, so moving that how are you and your family? I trust that you're well and your family is doing well. We want nothing but the best for you. We can't imagine a world without you, but then getting into where they disagree. So that's something worth reading and worth studying. Um, so some of his views, for instance, like he believed the Khalifa of the Muslim did not have to be from the Quraysh. Imam Layth ibn Sa'd had that view. Then the Khalifa did not necessarily have to be from the Quraysh. That's not what that hadith means. Um, and he's not the only one. I had a teacher in childhood, I remember he had the same view and that's the first time I had heard of that view. And it's also said Umar bin Abdul Aziz had that view. So it's about the person most competent, most knowledgeable to lead the Muslim Ummah. So there is a difference of opinion on even this issue, although the majority of scholars felt he had to be from the lineage of the Quraysh. Laith ibn Sa'd also had the view that any Muslim man could marry any Muslim woman. And you might say, well, doesn't everybody believe that? But no, in traditional fiqh, there's a kafa'a, there's an idea of there has to be a match. There has to be like same social ranking. There has, Because you have to understand these are tribal societies. Uh, this is a pre-modern era. Um, so part of fiqh, there's a whole discussion of who you can marry and what are the qualities that you have to have where you're not suitable. Imam Laith, he broke with that. He said, no, any believer can marry any uh, believer. And so these are some of the things that he was criticized for. Today sounds amazing in our modern sensibilities, but back then, these this was a controversy for him, and um, so it's something. Um, so he had he had he had a very original way of thinking. So Imam Malik, when he wrote his letter, he mentioned four or five fiqhi opinions of his, like like how could you hold these opinions, and we're we're responsible to the community. That shows you he was a he was a thinker. He was he was an original thinker, and he was you know he was. He had deep knowledge. He wasn't afraid to, you know, come up with like with an approach that might be different from those around him. His janaza was a huge janaza. He left behind a great legacy. A sadaf he says, I witnessed the janaza of Laith ibn Sa'd with my father, and I never saw a janaza greater than this. I saw everyone in a state of grief. They were consoling one another as if it was their own family. And I asked my father what was going on. He said, my son you would not see the likes of him ever again. So he died in the year 175 in Egypt. He's buried very close to the grave of Imam Shafiri, rahimahullah ta'ala. So that's Laith ibn Sa'd. So when you see this isnad, you have to kind of understand who these names are. I'm trying to bring these isnads alive for you because these are re realities for us. They're not just a series of names. So you have Amr ibn Khalid. He relates from Laith. And when you have Laith just like that, we know we're talking about Laith ibn Sa'd. Laith ibn Sa'd relates from who? Yazid. So Yazid, so sometimes you don't know the full name. You need the Hadith experts they knew because they knew who the teacher of Laith was. But this was Yazid ibn Abi Habib al-Azdi. He was the chief judge of Egypt prior to Imam Laith. So he was Mufti at Diyar al-Masriya. 
he may have been the first to have that title, but um, actually Abu al-Khayb before him had that title as well. So he was the chief mufti of Adiyar al-Masriya. And what's amazing about him, Imam al-Dhahbi says, وَكَانَ مِنْ جِلَّةِ الْعُلَمَاءِ الْعَامِلِينَ so he says he was one of the greatest ulama and umala, umala, alim and amil. Yani he practiced what he preached. And he was, he attained such a high rank in society despite the fact that he was black and he was a descendant of former slaves. That tells you how early Muslim society was. So Yazid ibn Abi Habib, among many others, was of Nubian black origin, and he was a chief mufti of, of Egypt. Ibn Yunus said about him, كَانَ يُفْتِي أَهْلَ مِصْرِ فِي زَمَانِهِ وَكَانَ حَلِيمًا عَاقِلًا وَهُوَ أَوَّلَ مَنْ أَظْهَرَ الْعِلْمَ بِمِصْرِ وَالْفِقْهِ وَالْكَلَامِ بِالْحَلَالِ وَالْحَرَامِ وَكَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكْ إِنَّمَا يَتَحَدَّثُونَ بِالْفِتَنْ وَالْمَلَاحِمِ وَكَانَ أَحَدُ الثَّلَاثَةَ الَّذِينَ جُعِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ أَوْ جَعَلَ إِلَيْهِمْ عُمَرَ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْعَزِيزِ الْفَتْيَا بِمِصْرِ He says he used to give fatwa in Egypt because he's the first one who brought real knowledge to Egypt. Knowledge of fiqh and kalam and halal and haram. Before his time, people in Egypt were just concerned with fitan and malahim, controversies and, and the battles and things like that. Um, and he is one of the three that Omar bin Abdul Aziz used to rely on for fatwa in Egypt. And as far as his grading, his trustworthiness, وَهُوَ مُجْمَعَ عَلَى الْإِحْتِجَاجُ بِهِ All hadith experts um, are unanimous in his trustworthiness. Yazid ibn Abi Habib, the great mufti of Egypt. And all six muhaddithin take from him. So his reports are in all six books. When we say all six relate from him, it doesn't mean He's the teacher of them, but he's in that in the chains. So they use the chains that have him in it. Because he's from like two generations earlier. He died in 128. And he takes from who? Abul Khair. So Abul Khair, his full name was Marthad. Marthad ibn Abdullah. He died in the year 90. He was a student of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, and he was a great Egyptian scholar and judge. Mufti ahla Misr fi ayamihi. So he was also the Mufti of the people of Egypt prior to Yazid. So what's amazing about this is not Mufti of Egypt, Mufti of Egypt, Mufti of Egypt. So all Egyptians in the Isnad. This is an amazing, amazing uh, hadith. It's an amazing Isnad. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. Who wants to read? Let's have a sister read. I can give this one. Keep that on that side. Mine, you want to read? Yeah. Well, I don't know the number. Start reading with Bisnadikum ilal Musannif. Bisnadikum ilal Musannif, and then you read. Call. Um, Bisnadikum. Miss Bisnadikum. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay. not written there. Oh, it's here. When, okay. No, no, it's not written here. But when you read, like, oh, make them when you read the hadith, because we're reading Bukhari, right? Now you, you you're going to get a jaz in Bukhari. Yes, yes, yes. You're going to say. Like you read with this intention, bi isnadikum ilal Bukhari. You can say it with al Bukhari. Okay, bi isnadikum ilal Bukhari. Qal. Qal. Now Bukhari is speaking. Now you read. Bab. Bab. Bab min al iman. Yes. Okay. Bab min al imani ay yuhibba la akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. Haddathana musaddan musaddadun qala haddathana Yahya an shu'bata. عن قطادة عن أنس رضي الله عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وعن حسين المعلم قال حدثنا قطادة عن أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه جزاك الله خير 
Okay, so this great hadith, we all know this hadith. Uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "You will never believe. None of you shall believe until he or she loves for his brother or sister what he or she loves for himself." So, this is a famous hadith, and it's from Iman. Here is linked to Iman. So, so self-explanatory hadith. Uh, you know, love, love for your brother what you love for yourself. Um, so love, love is very, very important. Love is, um, you know, the hadith is speaking about sincerity. It's not just superficiality, like, you know, saying salam to your fellow brother and sister, and just like being formal with them is a little different from love. So that, you know, you can say salam, you can't do these things without necessarily love. So the Prophet Wasallam. You know, he made it the perfection of Iman. He linked it to Iman that you really love for your brother what you love for yourself. This you can say is like the golden rule that they talk about in other traditions. Um, so it's very, very important. Um, it's a great Islamic teaching. It's very hard to do. You know, loving for someone the same thing that you love for yourself. That's very, very difficult to do. Um, it's, but that's that's the real test of iman. Iman is not easy. Iman is not something that is for lazy people. It's, it's, it requires effort. It requires work. It requires so many things. But when you get to this level where you truly, you have the same feelings for your fellow brother or sister that you have for yourself, meaning you treat everyone like family. So that's very, very altruistic and is something amazing and when you look in our tradition, our society, we have so many amazing instances of the companions and early Muslims acting in this way that should truly inspire us. So the isnad of this hadith. So who is the teacher of Bukhari that he gets this hadith from? Musaddad. Okay, Musaddad. Okay. So Musaddad, I don't think we covered him before. Because many of these names are being repeated. Laith we did cover before. But Musaddad, a very interesting person. He died in the year 228. So Musaddad was one of the best teachers of Bukhari. And uh, he's a top hadith expert in Basra. Basra. So Musaddad was from Basra. So he was, he was a major, major expert of hadith. He was a student of Sufyan ibn Uryayna, student of Fudayl ibn Uryad student of Yahya al-Qattan, student of Waqir ibn al-Jarrah, Hamad bin Zayd, many great individuals of hadith. And his students were Bukhari, Abu Dawood, Abu Hatim al-Razi, um, Abu Zura al-Razi, great experts. So in his lineage, his teachers and his students were some of the greatest experts that tells you who he was. So he was very reliable, but he's also something interesting about him is his name is kind of weird, Musaddad. Like, you don't come across a name like that. And that name was so funny to many people. It, and it's not just his name. So people talk, discussed his name and his old lineage. So if you know what his lineage was, I think I might have made a slide. OK, so his name was Musaddad. His father's name was Musarhad, and then his grandfather Musarbal. So, and so, in, and then his great grandfather Muraban. So his name was so interesting, and it's just like, you know, it's just an uncommon pattern that people used to make fun of it. So it's something that inspired so many stories, and and you know, like when students would study hadith, and they would say, "Oh, what's Musadda's name again?" You know, like someone has something interesting, everyone starts talking about that. So what's what's that guy's name again? What your hadith that you got from Musaddad? What's his name again? They they would talk about that in in um, in different gatherings, and there's so many funny things they say. Like someone said Ahmad al Ajli after you, like uh, um, I believe it was Ahmad ibn Hanbal was talking about it. And when he learned his name, he said Ya Ahmad, هذه رقية العقرب. This name is like a ruqya, like you can read it when you're stung by a scorpion. So if you're stung by a scorpion, you can use his name for like, like a magical spell or, um, you know, 
someone joked, Lo kutiba amama nasabihi bismillah rahman rahim. If you have his name, his full name, you can write bismillah in the beginning because it's kind of like it reads like a like a like a pattern, like a but and someone else gave his full name as the following. And if you see, oh, okay, sorry, I am online. So the full name, although this Imam Adhabi says this is an exaggeration, so when things like this happen, people tend to exaggerate. So the full name, according to one scholar, was the following. So I'll, I'll put it on the screen for you. Musaddad, Ibn Musarhad, Ibn Musarbal, Ibn Mugharbal, Ibn Mura'bal, Ibn Arandal, Ibn Sarandal, Ibn Gharandal, Ibn Masik, Ibn Mustawrid al Asadi. So that's probably an exaggeration. Imam al Dhabi says no way it could be that big. But the first four are accurate. Imam, Imam, uh, Imam al Bukhari has that, the name that I mentioned. But then, you know, when things take a life of their own and things become funny, then everyone starts talking about them. So what's interesting here, um, so Bukhari used to say about him, Musaddad ka ismihi. Musaddad is like his name, and he wasn't talking about the funny part. Musaddad comes from Sadid, being strong and firm. So the Musaddad itself, like he really was as he, his name. Musaddad means the firm, the strong one. So, but this is his full lineage, according to some, but at least the first four are accurate. Um, you know, people used to joke about, you know, if you're stung by a scorpion, recite his name, you'll be okay. Um, you know, Shay Akram mentions the point that that those were jokes, but some people took them seriously. So there's an Indian scholar who wrote a commentary on Sunan Abi Dawood, and he actually mentions that as a fact, as a recommendation, because he couldn't understand that it was a joke. He made a silly mistake. So people were joking, and it's recorded in books as a joke, but he actually wrote it as a recommendation for students. So it's just something you need to be very aware of this knowledge. People make silly mistakes like that. So Musaddad died in the year 228. Okay. And then who's his teacher above him? Okay, let me bring the slide back or forward. Okay. Yahya ibn Sa'id. Okay. So who is Yahya ibn Sa'id? Did we see him before? So Yahya ibn Sa'id, we saw him last week. Like, you guys are weak students. You don't remember where we left off. In tafsir class, we read a whole page again, which I remember reading. Nobody remembered that we read it last week. So Yahya ibn Sa'id was one of our narrators from last week. He was also in the first hadith of the Niyya, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. But this is a different Yahya ibn Sa'id. This is Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. Yahya al-Qattan. He died in the year 198. Yahya al-Qattan was one of the greatest hadith experts. So in hadith expert, uh, in ilal of hadith, you have a number of names. There's about 10 names. He's one of them, Yahya al-Qattan. So he's one of the true hadith experts, um, undisputed reliability. He was a, um, his teachers included Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Malik, Imam Shu'ba, and Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari, the one who's in the hadith of Niyya. So he was someone you know, worthy of studying. He's he's a major, major figure. Um, he was someone who was inclined to worship. For 20 years, it said he would finish the complete Quran every 24 hours. Yom wa Layla. He would finish the entire Quran for 20 years in 24 hours. Um, Ishaq, Yahya al-Qattan. So Ishaq al-Shahidi says, once I saw him pray Asr, and this... I'll just end with this one. This this gives you an image of who he was and just like what kind of person he was, just the picture that it paints. He said he prayed Asr and then he sat down in the masjid against the pillar. Um, and I saw him do that. And then some people came to him. They stood around him. And these people who stood around him were, among them were Ali ibn al-Madini, who was a teacher of Bukhari, a great hadith expert. One of them was Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahmad himself. Another one was Shah Dakuni, great author of hadith books. 
Fourth one was Yahya ibn Ma'in. Yahya ibn Ma'in is Ahmad's friend, another hadith expert. And number five, Amr ibn Ali al-Fallas. These are all hadith experts. So you can say five of the greatest hadith imams of the time were standing around Yahya al-Qattan, because he's from earlier generation, and they're all asking him questions about hadith, and he just answered question after question. And he said, his heba or his aura was such that none of them dared to sit down. I mean, we're talking about Imam Ahmad standing, not daring to sit down. And he said they kept asking questions until the Maghrib prayer came in and then they broke for Maghrib. It just tells you who Yahya al Qattan was. So he's, so he's the teacher of Musaddad. So Bukhari is, has a very high snad here. He gets hadith from this top expert who gets had this hadith from Yahya al-Qattan, another great expert. And then who is the teacher above him? Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj. What did we say about Shu'ba? Also great, great hadith expert, probably the founder of the science of Ilal. Talked about him, I believe, last week or the week before. So I'm not going to give his biography again. But so again, this Isnad is great hadith experts, the greatest hadith experts. So it's not just random names, it's the best of the best of the best in every generation. And they're all from Kufa. So Musaddad was from Kufa, uh, well, Basra rather, Basra. So this Isnad is all Basrans. <clears throat> and the Isnad prior to that was all Kufans and prior to that was Egyptians. So that's interesting. It tells you that knowledge generally stays in a region till it becomes widely dispersed all throughout the world. So Yahya ibn Sa'id, Al-Qattan from Shu'bah, and then Qatada. Who is Qatada? So Qatada, we did cover him in Hadith 101, and maybe Hadith 102. But let me take this opportunity to just review some things, because memory is not a strong point for you guys. Okay, um, just a quick review. This Hadith 102 and Hadith 101, the class all of you took and all of you were writing down and then he destroyed your notes. The science of Jarh wa Ta'adil, transmitter criticism. Just some quick notes, just to bring these names alive for you. Um, when we say thiqa, a trustworthy narrator, it's when he has adala and dabt. And quick review, those five conditions of Sahih Hadith, one of them is accuracy, like good memory or good notes. That's a dubbed. And the other is being morally upright, adala. There's no red flags in their character and they're not belonging to any deviant groups in a major way. When you have both qualities, moral and academic, then the narrator is thiqa, he's deemed trustworthy. So we, we say that a lot. This reporter was deemed to be thiqa, trustworthy. So that, that's what that generally means. Just a quick review. Oh, online, sorry. This is the slide I'm talking about. Again, thiqa equals adala plus dabt. And then, this is very important. We mentioned that among the tabi'een, among the junior tabi'een, there were six individuals that the majority of the isnads go through. They're called madarul hadith, the six pivots of hadith. So who are these six pivots of hadith? We went through them, but one of them from Medina was Zuhri, the teacher of Malik. In Mecca, it was Amr ibn Dinar, and he's the one who narrated the hadith of Rahma, the first hadith we, we, we learned. So in Medina, Zuhri. In Mecca, Amr ibn Dinar. In Basra, you had two individuals, Qatada ibn Di'ama Sadusi, who died in the year 117, who was a reporter in this chain. And Yahya ibn Abi Kathir also from Basra. Then in Kufa, you had Abu Ishaq al-Sabiri. And then in and the second person in Kufa, al-A'mash, Suleiman ibn Maharan al-A'mash. So these were the great hadith experts of their time in the time of the Tabirin. Prior to them, it's the Sahaba and the early Tabirin, like Sa'id ibn Musayyib. They transmitted their knowledge. You had the seven jurists of Medina, but then, these are the six people that really 
began to teach hadith professionally such that most of the isnads in the world go through them. They're called Madarul Hadith. And this is the time of Tabirin, very early on. We're just giving you a chronology of hadith science. So Madarul Hadith, there will be generally second or third in the chain when we read these books of hadith. It's from the books of hadith going back it's generally three generations. And then from them, knowledge was transferred to these individuals. So this is a great slide. I did share it earlier in Hadith 102 that gives you an outline of who were the giants in Ilal, Hadith criticism. So from those six, Madarul Hadith, the second, the next generation was right here on top. In Basra, you had Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj, who was in our chain. We talked about him last week. And you had Hamad bin Zayd, two in Basra. In Medina, you had Imam Malik. So this is the generation after the Madar al-Hadith. In Mecca, you had Sufyan. In Kufa, you had Sufyan. Which Sufyan was in Mecca? Which one was in Sufa? Uh, in Kufa? Uh, Kufa was uh, Sufyan ibn Yeah, so Mecca is Sufyan ibn Aryena. In the interest of the space, I didn't write the full name. But Sufyan ibn Aryena is, is the one in Mecca. And what hadith is he part of that we all share? The hadith? The Rahma, yeah, the first hadith, hadith of Rahma. He's the one who narrated that, started that tradition. And he relates it from uh, Amr ibn Dinar. And in Kufa, who was a Sufyan in Kufa? A Thawri, yeah, Sufyan a Thawri. So those two Sufyan, they're from the same generation, great individuals. So just giving you in every generation who are the great individuals. So six were Madarul Hadith. After them, the greatest experts were these, Imam Malik, Imam Sufyan, Ibn Aryana, Sufyan al Thawri, Shorba ibn al-Hajjaj, and Hamad bin Zayd. Among these, Shorba is the one who really knew his ilal, the ilm al-jarh wa ta'adil. The real, you know, the cream of the science of hadith that not everyone reaches is the science of criticism, hadith crit criticism, ilal. Very few people reach that level. So. Imam Shorba is probably one of the, you can say, the originator of, of that science. Then after his generation, you had Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. So he's the one who inherited the knowledge of Shorba in hadith criticism. And among his contemporaries were Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. Among his contemporaries were Waqir ibn al-Jarrah. And among his contemporaries were Abu Nu'aym al-Fadl ibn Dukain. Abu Nu'aym was the teacher that Imam Ahmad and Yahya visited in his old age. And then he's the one who kicked, you know, uh, kicked Yahya ibn Ma'in because they tried to trick him. So in this generation, these were the four top scholars of Hadith. Yahya ibn Sa'id, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Abu Nu'aym, and Waqir. Then the next generation, the great figures of the next generation, Ali ibn al-Madini, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Yahya ibn Ma'in, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. These are the four top experts of their time in, in, in that generation. And then from them, you have Imam Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Hatim al-Razi and Abu Zurar al-Razi. And Bukhari was a student of Ali ibn al-Madini. And then the generation after them, the best experts were Nasa'i ibn Khuzayma. And then the generation after them, Daru Qutni. Daru Qutni is probably the Khatim, the seal. Dar Qutni is the last great expert of Ilal. You know, the real, the differences in the Isnads and the, the defects of, hidden defects of Hadith. After that, it was just the rehash, like the knowledge didn't take it further. You had great individuals, but now they're relying on the work of this, these generations. But this snapshot is very important. Now that we're gonna look at name after name, it's important to have a chronology. So Madar al-Hadith, and then these individuals, generation by generation, until it reaches Bukhari. The best of the best of each generation, you can say, is Shorba, Yahya ibn Sa'id, Ali ibn al-Madini, and Imam al-Bukhari. Then everyone else uh, in each generation is secondary. Wallahu a'lam. Any questions on this? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Your question was probably answered last week and the week before when you weren't here. But we'll indulge you, inshallah.
So they traveled to be students, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you have the title Al Bukhari, it means that's where you're from. It could mean that's where you're from, or it could mean that's where you settled. So often it's uh, um, like Imam Shafari. Where did he, where did he settle? Like Muhammad bin Idris Shafari. Egypt, yeah. But I found out last night, I, I didn't realize that Imam Shafri was born in Gaza. Gaza is a blessed place. Imam Shafri was born there. So, like in his, so if you read his name and the titles, it would have that title there. Um, Al Asqalani is Asqalan, which is near Gaza. Um, so, Al Asqalani is, so generally they'll have Al Asqalani, Thumma Al Madani, Thumma Al Masri. So, people would live in different places. So all those places, if they you spent a predominant amount of time there, they would be part of your um, uh, your lineage or how you are known as. But when we say they're from Basra, we mean that's where they taught, that's where people traveled to learn from them. So their their formal teaching circles were in those regions. So they would travel to learn, but generally, and sometimes to teach, but generally they would sit in one place and teach, and people would come and travel to them. Like Imam Malik was in, you know, Sufyan was in the Haram. Imam Malik was in Medina. Uh, Sufyan Authority was teaching in Kufa. So generally people stuck to their regions. So it's pretty consistent. But they would travel like, uh, who was the person last week that traveled to Baghdad and had 20 sessions of Hadith where he taught 1,000 Hadith in each session? Um, I forget who it was, but it was someone last week. So a lot of people learned Hadith from him in Baghdad, but that's not where he was from. Um, Allahu alam. Is that what you were asking? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So coming back to the hadith, did we finish the isnad? So qatada, qatada is one of the. We were at qatada. I just wanted to share that to show you uh, who qatada is. So you can see here. So Musaddad, teacher of Bukhari, Yahya ibn Sa'id is the best of his generation. Shorba is the best of generation, and then Qatada is the best of generation. Qatada brings you to the Tabi'een. Above Qatada, you have who? Anas bin Malik. So Qatada is a major, major Madarul Hadith. Um, you know, Qatada, there's so much you can say about him. He was, he was blind since the age of four. He was born the year 60. So 60 years after the Hijrah, he was born. He was an authority and expert of four sciences, Tafsir, Tariq, history, fiqh, and hadith. He learned from Hassan al-Basri and Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Um, he said, I sat with Hassan al-Basri for 12 years learning from him. So it's not just like a random learning, sitting. So Qatada is, so these Madar al-Hadith, they're really absorbing the knowledge of the companions and early generations, like in a very deep way. And then they're professionally teaching and that's why most isnads go through them because this is their, you know, their background. And he said, I prayed Fajr with Hassan al-Basri for three years straight, every single day. That's amazing. Imagine how much he learned from him. He learned from Ata ibn Abi Rabah. He, firm, he learned from Ikrima. We saw him last week or two weeks ago. The freed slave of Ibn Abbas. He learned from Sha'bi. And they met many companions too, like Anas bin Malik. So... Qatada had a prodigal memory. He used to say, uh, I've never heard anything except that I memorize it. And being blind, that's what happens when you're blind and heightens your other senses. Um, so he, he also said, My two ears never heard something except that my heart memorized it immediately. Um, one time he was reading Surah Al-Baqarah, reviewing it to a student, and the student was holding a mushaf, um, and he made zero mistakes, Surah Al-Baqarah, beginning to end. And he told his student, I heard all the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah from his Sahifa once, and I knew them just like I know the Surah. So that's how he knew his hadith as well. Um, According to one estimation, the Sahifa of Jabir was 400 hadith. So he knew 400 hadith just by hearing them once. He used to say, uh, Takrirul hadith fil majlis uh, yadhabu nuruhu. 
He says, repeating a hadith in a majlis takes away the light of the gathering. What does that mean? It means when a student asks the teacher to repeat something, it takes away the light. And it shows you that's not they're not serious. And he said, وَمَا قُلْتُ لِأَحَدٍ قَدْ أَعِدَ عَلَيَّ He said, I have never said to anyone, repeat. Just once, and I know it. I've never asked anyone to repeat anything. Um, so he was, and he's very much similar to Zuhri. Remember we talked about Zuhri, he was like that as well, the teacher of Imam Malik, also from his same generation. Um, once he came to, who was the best of the Tabi'een? Like the single best. After the Sahaba, the next generation, there are a number of contenders, but who's one of them? The top contender. Huh? Okay, yeah, that's one opinion. What, what about someone else? Someone related to Abu Huraira. Wais al Qarni is most people class from a Sahabi because of his interaction with the Prophet. But yeah, he would be the best of the Tabarin for some, yes. But there's who's a relative of Abu Huraira and the best of the Tabarin? Imam Ahmad said, Huwa khayru Tabarin. The single best in virtue. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> Who's like Abu Huraira sat in a circle learning and then he married the daughter of his teacher. So he's Abu Huraira's father in law. Who was that? That's an amazing story. Like in his, his own story. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. So he's a uh, Imam Ahmad considered him the best of the Tabarin. So, um, and so he was, Abu Huraira learned from him. Yeah. So it's a different opinion, but yeah, you're right. There's a hadith, Waisul Qarni Khairu Tabarin Abi Ihsan. So there's a number of contenders, but Waisul Qarni, he is placed among the Sahaba in many books. But so it's a, it's it's you know it's it's a different opinion on him, but I'm not saying absolutely he is the best. I'm, I just want to talk about Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Imam Ahmad considered him the best of the Tabarin of all of them. So Qatada came to Sa'id ibn Musayyib. That was his teacher, and he spent eight days with him. You know he wanted to spend eight days with him, but after three days, Sa'id ibn Musayyib got up and he smacked him on the chest. He said, "Oh blind one." He said, uh, Oh, blind one, leave me, for you have taken all my hadith and not left any. In three days, he learned everything. And even the teacher realized, well, this is an amazing person. So, Qatada, you know, from the most knowledgeable person in Medina, he absorbed his entire knowledge in three days. Um, Saeed used to say, Ma atani Iraqi ahfad min. Qatada. No Iraqi came to me that was more learned than Qatada. So Qatada was an amazing, amazing individual. I have pages and pages of notes about him, but this is not a biography class. Um, but he's someone you have to know. Qatada ibn Di'ama as Sanusi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He's from, um, he from Basra. Qatada ibn Di'ama Sadusi of Basra. So the six, the, the way you memorize these things, to help your memory. So these templates that I, I'm giving you, like six here, this generation, those are easier to memorize. You, get, you have to have these templates in your mind. So six madarul hadith not that hard. So six madarul hadith, majority of isnads go through them. So that means you just have to know six names and you know you can be familiar with a lot of isnads. And these six, how do you divide them up? Divide them up by region. So there's one from Medina. Who's from Medina? Okay. Zuhri. So if you, Zuhri is from Medina. One from Makkah. Who's from Makkah? Amar, Amar ibn Dinar from Makkah. And then there's two from Kufa and two from Basra. So that's how you remember them. So from Basra, you have Qatada. And so and in Kufa, you had Armash and you had. Uh, it's on the slide. 
Basra. Two from Kufa and two from Basra. So, you know, to memorize names, you, you, you need to memorize something about them. Zuhri, the teacher of Nalik. Sufyan, the one of Hadith Rahma. Just these little things that you know about. So if you associate that little tidbit, that's not, def that's not what defines them, but if you associate that in your minds, then it helps you remember things a lot easier. So these are like little hacks. So that's Qatada. And then Bukhari brings a second Isnad. So if you look at his Hadith, what does he say? Yeah, so he says, Haddathana Musaddad, Qala Haddathana Yahya, An Shu'ba, An Qatada, An Anas, An In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he says, Wa An Hussein Al Mu'allim, Qala Haddathana Qatada, An Anas, An In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qal La Yu'minu Ahadukum. So he brings a second isnad before he gets to the hadith. So he brings a second isnad, so he says, from Hussein al Mu'allim, from Qatada, from Anas. So when you read that, what's going on there? What's going on is there is that he's bringing a second teacher um, from Qatada. So, so what would be the full isnad? It's on the screen. Musaddad from Yahya ibn Sa'id al Qattan, from Hussein al Mu'allim, from Qatada, from Anas ibn Malik. Okay? So, the question is, why does he do that? You know, nothing in Bukhari is random. So there's some discussion about why. So the problem with Bukhari and, and people who are brilliant and geniuses, like, they don't explain themselves. They're not going to say, hey, guys, this is what I'm doing here. Hey, did you notice it? No. They just do it. So it, it's left for great students to analyze their work and, and to see what they're doing and why they're doing it. So here he brings a second isnad. So generally, why would you bring a second Isnad? What are some of the reasons? Let me hear from you. Very good, to make it more stronger. So that's a, so generally when you bring a second Isnad, you bring it to make the first one stronger. So now the question is, is that what he's doing here? So if you look at the first Isnad, the best of the best of the best. So, that's probably not what's happening here. Although many scholars did write is to support the first Isnad, but the first Isnad is on his primary conditions. Okay, so it's fully strong. So people don't understand that. They, they, they believe it's bringing support, but that cannot be the case. Look at the first Isnad by itself. It's fully strong. He does not need to bring a second one. But generally, that's the reason people bring a second one. Or two, sometimes for a specific reason. So... Um, here, I mean, we don't really know. Um, so Shehakar, for instance, says he, view, he believes that these are the two best isnads in the hadith of Anas. And because Bukhari is not repeating this isnad again, he's sharing both here. <coughs> he normally doesn't do that. What he normally does is all the best isnads, he'll bring them in the book. He'll divide them up throughout the book. So this hadith, he'll bring this isnad, the same hadith, he repeats it again. He'll bring another good isnad in another chapter. So this isnad, he doesn't bring again. So that probably wants to show you both strong isnads from him, from Anas. So that's one possible reason why he shares this isnad here. Um, another possible reason is, Qatada, despite being Madar al-Hadith, you know, he had a problem, and his problem was a potential problem. He was guilty of, or he engaged in Tadlis. So Qatada was known for Tadlis. Like, tadlis is what? Who remembers what Tadlis is? From... Yeah, so when you relate Hadith in an ambiguous way, so you, it might be relating from someone you didn't meet, or you relate from someone by changing his name. So, so or you relate in a way that it sounds like you heard the hadith, but you didn't. Um, so it's kind of like a, a concealment. It, doesn't, it wasn't a good thing for hadith experts. So people were engaged in tadlis, 
I mean, why did they do that? We already talked about that. Um, it wasn't purposeful for many. And also, this is very early on. The rules haven't been set down yet. So many people are relating, like Imam Malik accepted Mursal Hadith. So he wasn't that interested in fully connected chains. But as long as Zuhri, he trusts Zuhri. If Zuhri relates from the Prophet, um, so Zuhri relates some Hadith directly from the Prophet. He didn't meet the Prophet. So Imam Malik accepted that from Zuhri. So, but other experts did not. And so, so that's one of the reasons why people engage in that. But now, the, the issue here is if you look at Tadlis, so in the first, so Tadlis, one rule of Hadith experts is that when someone is known for Tadlis, we don't take their Hadith where they say an from their teacher, from their teacher, without specifying directly whether they heard it or not. So in the first it's not, is he saying on from his teacher or is he saying I heard my teacher? He's saying on. So on is when you have a modellus reporter relating from his teacher through the link on, on the authority of which doesn't tell you how you got the hadith. Most hadith experts did not like that. They did not take that. It's not. Um, so one possibility could be that the second Isnad Bukhari brought to clarify that he did hear the hadith. Because what does the second Isnad say from Qatada? What does Qatada say? Oh yeah, so it's, it's still on. So, so that's not the reason here. Like, it's not to share with you that Qatada, um, whether he heard the hadith or not. So that cannot be the reason that he's sharing this hadith. So that's that's a possibility. Qatada was known for Tadli, so maybe he brought the second isnad to support, but it doesn't do that because it still has on. But the but the issue here is the reason this is not a problem because shorba, shorba was the one who said something famous. He said, Tadlisu akhul kathib. Tadlis is the brother of lying. Shorba was the strictest of the hadith experts on this matter of Tadlis. And Shorba even said, like it's an exaggeration, but he said, for me, someone to commit zina is better than him to commit Tadlis. So Shorba was so strict on that matter. He's a, so Shorba, when he relates from people, he does his due diligence and research. So Shorba is the one relating from Qatada. That's why Bukhari accepts this. If Shorba got this from Qatada, he must have made certain that Qatada did not. He actually heard this hadith. So there's no problem here in that respect. So this is something, a tidbit of hadith criticism that you need to know. But actually, uh, in the, in, you know, below Qatada here, you have a difference in the two isnads. So the first one is an shorba an qatada. And then the second one is an Hussein qal hadathan an qatada. So the first one is not clear if shorba heard the hadith from qatada or not. But the second one, Hussein says, qatada actually said this hadith uh, from the Prophet. So that's a difference. Maybe he's trying to bring that to show you, but still that doesn't, that, that's not a convincing explanation. So we don't really know, but Shaykh Hakam says, it's just to give you two primary isnads, that's to show you these are great isnads of Anas bin Malik, some of the best isnads from Anas. And sometimes he does that, he'll bring the isnad before this uh, text of the hadith. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. And we covered the hadith, so that is our class for today. Any floor is open for questions. Yeah, Hassan al Basri engaged in Mursal Hadith a lot too. So, the early generations, the science wasn't crystallized. 
So to be to be fair to them, you know, everyone had different approaches, and there wasn't a, uh, a you know a set standard yet, although they were you know beginning to be developed. So a lot of early Muslims engaged in irsal. Irsal means just relating from someone without a connected isnad. But the issue now is like, okay, do you take from those early individuals? So like the hadith experts like Bukhari, they wanted connected chains. Bukhari did not generally accept hadith unless he was certain that it came from the Prophet with connected chains. Um, Hassan al-Basri, his mursal hadith are the weakest among the early Muslims. So Hassan al-Basri, there are a lot of fabricated hadith and a lot of custom material that goes through him from Ali and, and others. And he was not known to have met. I mean, he met the companion. He was raised in the house of Umm Salama. Hassan al-Basri was raised in the house of Umm Salama. So he lived his life among the companions. But early in his life, he was engaged in jihad. He, was in, he wasn't engaged in knowledge. He was engaged in jihad. Only when he came back from all the expeditions of the Umayyads, um, he found that now there's circles of knowledge everywhere. And he said, started learning from other junior companions and others. But then he would relate from higher up. That's just a personal thing he had. So he would relate from higher up. So Hassan al-Basri is slightly problematic in that regard from a hadith perspective. Not as an individual, he's not problematic, but at a hadith isnad perspective. So there are hadith from him in Sahih al-Bukhari, but not a lot, and only when he's certain that he did hear from someone who heard from someone. Allahu a'lam. Any other questions? Yeah. Where's the microphone? Because people online can hear. So. <clears throat> so I just want to understand one thing. So when you are looking at hadith, uh, as I'm sure, I mean, we have already had this conversation. Now. So how do you critique the like a faqih who takes? Or we mentioned the conditions of you know sahih and da'if. So when they don't have dubbed and they you let's say a muhaddith classified as da'if but they still accept it in like a muhaddith how does he look at this like would you accept that hukum that, that they take from this uh, narration that is obviously not strong or how does a muhaddith generally look at this uh, concept from the uh, like a faqih yeah so the faqih is looking at other factors beyond the hadith report so and there were different approaches. There will always be different approaches with different opinions. So for Imam Mal, so the letter that I referenced, Malik and Laith. So one of the main things that he addresses in that letter, Malik makes the case for why he regards the Amal of Ahl al Madina to be a proof. So what is Amal al Ahl al Madina for Imam Malik? Hadith was important, but along with Hadith, there was another factor. He looked at what people were doing in the Masjid of the Prophet, so I saw them in the early generations. For him, the city of the Prophet ﷺ preserved the early Muslim society. It's the best snapshot of what the Sunnah should be. So for him, what people did in Medina um, was a proof. So if people like Zuhri, people like the early Sa'id ibn Musayyib, if they believe something was Sunnah, that's proof for him. He didn't have to necessarily have a report going back to the Prophet ﷺ. That was good enough for him. Now, obviously, others disagreed with that. Laith ibn Sa'd disagreed with that. So Laith ibn Sa'd, in his reply in the letter, he said, well, so Imam Malik said, well, well, he had said, well, every person then in every region could say, this is what our people do in Kufa, because we have the students of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in Kufa, and in Mecca, they could say the same thing. So that cannot be approved. You need to have reports. You need to have evidence. For us, evidence is reports and not the practice of a people. Um, but Imam Malik wrote, well, Medina is not like the other cities. Medina is different. Medina is the city of the Prophet. So Salaam, this is where Islam was first established. For all these reasons, he believes Medina is different from the other cities and should have a different approach. But the, these two great Imams disagreed. Imam al-Shafri did not, uh, he disagreed on that too. Imam al-Shafri is the one who brought Hadith back to the equation. He said, 
well, every region could just follow their region, and this is what our people do. That's not good enough for knowledge. Our preservation of Islam and the Sunnah is that you have to have proof and evidence. And proof and evidence for us is haddathana. This person said, this person said, this person said, going back to the Prophet So early fuqahad, they were arranged. Most of them looked at the practices and the, the great experts of each time. And then uh, they were also looking at hadith as a factor, but not the primary factor for some of them. For some of them, it was the primary factor. And then later on, things got complicated when there was all this debates and fighting. And then in the latter fiqh tradition, because hadith, Imam Shafi revived this idea of having proof and, and hadith so much that every school after him wanted to have hadith in their favor, and they didn't. So there was, some of them invented hadith. So, so many later fiqh books were filled with hadith, but the you know, fabricator hadith, mistakes, and not the best hadith. So because, why? Because there was an incentive now. We have to have a hadith for this. Even it carries on to our time. Everyone talks about hadith, 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 which is good. I mean, but even the fiqh guys today, people who follow madhahib, they're always talking about hadith. Their brain proof is always trying to find a hadith that supports their... And that's the wrong approach. The early fuqaha were not doing that. They were giving you the sunnah through this whole group of factors. But which approach do we follow? Obviously, I'm in the line of Imam al-Bukhari. For us, you know, you need to have evidence and you need to have like a sound uh, report that's connected going back to the Prophet ﷺ. But we respect everyone who has other approaches like Imam Malik. He's a great Imam. He's a great muhaddith, but he's he's looking at the Amal Ahl al Madina. He's accepting Mursal Hadith as a proof for him. Uh, it's not necessarily the case for Imam Bukhari. So there's going to be many different approaches. You need to respect all of them as students of knowledge, but you need to adopt one. So with the hadith and the reports, you know, and you know, there's a standard that everyone can follow. With the others, it's subjective. Like Amal Ahl al-Madina does not work for someone who doesn't believe in that. So a Maliki could say that all his wants that in, in Medina this is what we do. But if you're not Maliki and you don't you need a you know a stronger proof, that's not going to be convincing for others. Wallahu a'lam. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. So Imam Bukhari's generation was very early. This is before, I mean, you have madhahib by now, but not that formalized yet. So um, his teacher is Imam Ahmad. Right, so so that's very early. So people say Imam Bukhari was this or that, and whether it's you know it's, it cannot be accurate because this is before that time where there were formal affiliations with Madhahib. Yeah, so 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 he was an independent mujtahid. The real answer is he looked at every opinion and he gave his answer. So every chapter in Sahih Bukhari especially the fiqh chapters are his views based on his research, based on the reports. So it's not just reports, he's also looking at other things in the chapter headings, he's looking at what Omar said and what Abu Bakr said and his bigger understanding. So, but he's independent, so you cannot lump him in any school. So, and that's, that's if he wasn't part of any school, then it would not be widely read today, right? Today. Hanafis read Sahih Bukhari, they teach Sahih Bukhari because he supports the Hanafi view in so many issues. Shafiris use Sahih Bukhari, Imam Malikis use Sahih Bukhari, and they consider this book one of their own. The fact that every mother today reads Sahih Bukhari through, through their own lens, but they find enough to support their madhab in there, this book supports all the madhabs, but it doesn't support just one exclusively. That shows you Bukhari was an independent thinker. Some issues, he took the, the Kufan approach. Some issues he agreed with Imam Malik, some issues he agreed with others. So he was an independent thinker. So he's a mujtahid, that's what you can say. How would you describe his fiqh? Allahu alam, that's a PhD dissertation. Some would say it's Ahl al-Hadith. But Ahl al-Hadith is just a loaded term. It's not that meaningful because Ahl al-Hadith means so many different things. So 
he's not just a hadith person. That's a misnomer. Bukhari is looking at bigger picture. He's looking at sunnah, not just hadith reports, and using the best hadith reports to support his views on the sunnah. And that is why there are some chapters have no hadith. There are some chapters there where he gives you his opinion on what the sunnah is on something. There's no hadith because he never found a hadith, but that means he was looking at other things. And then in some chapters, you know, uh, so Allahu alam, but he was a mujtahid thinker. I think there should be a Bukhari in Madhab today. Like some of us should be followers of Bukhari. <laughs> I was thought about that. I was like, give me all the opinions of Bukhari and let me just follow those. I'll call myself Bukhari and like in, in, in fiqh or legals, maybe we can revive that. Yeah, Umdatul Ahkam, isn't that Hanbali though? Like, huh? Okay. And I found Hanbalis are the ones who rely on this book the least. No, on Sahil Bukhari. No, I know, but Umdatul Ahkam is selection. No, this is still not the original. Original is original. Nothing else is original. So I feel like. In one sense, the Hanbalis are the farthest from Sahih al-Bukhari. Because of their view, of the, they, they have so many different hadith, they, they follow weak hadith, and following weak hadith is not in line with Bukhari's methodology. Maybe that's why. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, they kind of did, but like maybe they didn't give a name to it. Like, because when he when you read the biography of Bukhari, like when he came to like that area where he had controversy, so his biography it says like I remember and they said that when Bukhari came to Rai where um, a Duhali who kicked him out exiled him, he said like Bukhari stayed in the Ahl al Hadith quarters of the town. So when you traveled in the past, like you would stay stick to your kind. So there was a, a neighborhood where all the Ahl al-Hadith would go, the Hadith experts. By Ahl al-Hadith, they meant the Hadith experts like Bukhari, Razi, and Muslim. And they would stay together. And he said, these people, we could tell by their praying, they would raise their hands, roughly a day. So they did have a way of approaching. So you could tell that they were different from the rest because they would raise their hands coming up from Ruku or because that's in Bukhari. So they did have certain features that defined them. But why did their madhab did not become into a strong madhab maybe i mean maybe it could be argued the ahl al hadith or early ahl al hadith that's what they were allah alam i don't know much enough about that to make a judgment okay jazakum allah khair fatah allah alaykum sallallahu ala khairi khalqihi muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wasallam